uh, Vishay, Vice President of the Supreme Administrative Court of Thailand, distinguished guests, ladies and gen gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to me to very warmly welcome all of you to this conference today. And uh, after the welcoming ceremony, ceremony yesterday, the opening ceremony, we are looking forward to several discussions with our distinguished speakers. To introduce myself, I will be your MC today. My name is Andreas Graz and I'm officer at the CPG. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to lead you through the today's events. Firstly, I would like um, Mr. Elas, Professor Elas, to come here and to, uh, to, deliver, to deliver the welcoming remarks. So, um, Professor Elas from the University of Münster. Imagine the amount of work that is necessary. 
I would like to conclude by welcoming you, dear ladies and gentlemen, and by opening our fourth symposium of the German Southeast Asian Center of Excellence for Public Policy and Good Governance. And I wish us all a productive for your welcoming speech. And since we have the pleasure of the presence of Dean Narong, of the, the Dean of the Faculty of Law of Thomas Hart University, I would like him to, to deliver as well some, some words. Dean Narong, please. Uh, once we include the experience 
of um, countries from Asia. Anyway, as I said in my own um, remarks, I'll focus on um, modern Western societies and the relationship between religion and collective identity there. Now, if we even ask this question today, we may initially think that it is almost counterintuitive in today's West to connect religion with collective identity formation in the first place. The reason for that is that at least at first sight, religion seems to have become in the West again an entirely private affair. The privatization of religion was the political program of 19th century progressives. Since the late 20th century, it seems to have become reality. Secularization has not brought the end of religion, and most observers by now seem willing to accept that this is not going to happen in the foreseeable future either. But it has, but modernity has transformed religion in various ways, and one way this has occurred, or so it seems, is that religion has ceased being considered a public good and is instead viewed as a private good. It may therefore appear as if the alignment of religion with collective identity is a thing of the past. Like many traditions, it may continue to linger, for example in institutions like the Church of England, but this would be little more, we might say, than folklore. The real battles about religion, so it might seem, are today battles about individual worldviews, their practical consequences and their integration into a secular and pluralistic society. Well, part of my purpose um, in this presentation is to challenge this perception and argue that it's facile. The public role of religion may have changed and may continue to change, but it is not going away. And it's therefore important to understand what it may consist in and how we would want it to develop. One major argument along those lines was impressively presented a few years ago by José Casanova in his important book, Public Religions in the Modern World. Casanova countered the narrative of religious privatization with a detailed analysis of four very different cases in which religion more recently regained a public role, for better or worse, we might say. The cases he looked at were Poland, with its Catholic Church famously contributing to the overthrow of the communist regime. Spain, where by contrast, in Casanova's analysis, the Catholic Church struggled from the after effects of their close alliance with Franco's dictatorship. The rise of the so-called religious right in the US. And finally Brazil, where the Church has for the first time managed to emancipate itself from the shackles of its long-time association with the state. The upshot of Casanova's theory is, or Casanova's analysis, is that contrary to common assumptions, a long-term close association between church and state and its public engagement, including its contribution to social and political controversies, is inevitably tainted by this association. Often these churches find it difficult to distinguish their specific religious message from the essentially political context in which they are embedded. Characteristically thus, the churches with long-standing ties to their respective governments, and in Casanova's analysis, these were the Catholic churches in Spain and Brazil, were far less successful as public agents than their counterparts in the US and in Poland, two countries which, in spite of obvious differences, share the radical separation between church and state, at least until 1989. Casanova, I'm not a social scientist, but a theologian with historical interests. But my results will, in some ways, at least echo those yielded by his research. I, too, shall seek to show that it is far from evident that in today's world, religion has ceased to perform a public or social role. This function may recede into the background in times of social and political stability, but it's ready to come to the fore as soon as the latter become more elusive. 
In arguing this case, however, my ultimate interest is again different, or at least it's more specific than Casanova's was. I'm not going to consider any form of social or political activity religious communities may engage in, but shall inquire into their potential or actual role for social integration and collective identity. This, it seems to me, is a much more serious, problematic and contentious issue than the more general assumption that religious communities have their part to play in the social and political realm. The latter may pose a problem for an extreme interpretation of religion as private, as it was understood, for example, in the former communist countries in Eastern Europe. But it can easily be integrated into a pluralistic framework as long as churches or generally religious communities can be understood as agents within civil society and agree to play by its rules. If religion underwrites collective identity, however, a religious community, and probably only one or only a few, seems destined to occupy a unique and privileged position in society and state by virtue of its ability to stem the centrifugal forces that threaten to compartmentalize and even atomize societies. This evidently is a rather major claim with considerable political, legal, and many other, including financial, implications. Not surprisingly, therefore, it has been and continues to be hugely controversial. It is easy to see that, at the very least, it exists in tension with the principle of the separation of church and state, and also has serious implications for religious pluralism which it endangers on account of the privileges extended to one or a select few religions. In fact, one may take this a step further and suspect that a strong link between collective religious and political identities unmasks religious pluralism as an illusion. And of course that's a case that's been argued from people with very different interests um, um, uh, who in a way agree on this particular problem. For if religion is aligned to collective identity, might one not conclude that it can only be either conducive or detrimental to the flourishing of a particular society? In other words, will not perhaps the very existence of a minority religion pose an actual threat to the cohesion of the society? Well, this sure enough was what right into the 19th century the English, and I might add the Prussians, suspected Catholicism to do, while the French had similar fears about their Protestants. Yet it is easy to perceive behind current Western Islamophobia the same fundamental fear. On a minority religion, who knows what it does to um, political and social stability. The question about the relationship between religion and collective identity thus takes us right to the heart of two central problems in modern Western nation-states. How can they have stable existence in a state of internal peace? And secondly, how can and should religion be integrated into such a commonwealth? Of course, I have neither the time nor the competence to sketch these two issues even in their broadest possible outlines. For my topic today, it is however crucial to see that, they have, that these two questions have framed the debates about Christianity and national identity in Europe and North America since the 19th century. I shall illustrate this briefly with a number of examples which I hope will show how diverse the responses were while also demonstrating some crucial similarities. And for those of you who look at the abstract estimated um, and I must admit, I submitted it before I'd written the paper. You will notice that at the time I was a little over ambitious um, with regard to the uh, examples I would sketch. So, not all of those that are mentioned on the handout um, will actually be discussed um, um, in what follows. My first, my first example takes us back to Britain in the early 1830s, 
This was a time of considerable change in the relationship between church and state. The so-called Corporation and Tests Act from 1673, which had made an affiliation with the Church of England practically the precondition for holding any public office, was about to be scrapped. The establishment of the Anglican Church of Ireland, a country we must remember, um, with a tiny minority of Protestants among a huge majority of Catholics. Um, um, so that um, is a particularly weird form of, of religious establishment, was equally under debate. The final step was the emancipation of Roman Catholics. Um, while the Church of England itself was not going to be disestablished, and as many of you will know, has not been until this day, it could easily appear at the time that this too was on the cards. In this situation, a number of academics and churchmen, not many were in fact both, found together in, or came together in Oxford to organize resistance against this development. One of the early spokespeople for the so-called Oxford movement was John Keeble, who provided the fanfare with a sermon he preached on the 14th of July, 1833, on the topic, and you know, you just have to hear the title, and then you know what's coming. The topic is national apostasy. National apostasy. The apostasy of the nation was, of all things, the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland. For Cuba, this amounted to the nation's renunciation of its age-old pact with God Himself. And I give you a few of his words. So he says, he speaks of a nation that has, for centuries, acknowledged as an essential part of its theory of government that as a Christian nation she is also a part of Christ's church and bound in all her legislation and policy by the fundamental rules of that church. So what he's worried about is that um, such a nation um, would deliberately throw off the restraint which in many respects such a principle would impose on them or even disavow the principle itself. So that's, that's the specter that, that, that